Last week, uh, Pastor Mark shared some of his story about him and Laura, and it inspired me. And uh, so I got to share a little bit about my story uh, and one little yes, uh, how that changed my life. Nina and I had been dating a couple years, and she was ready for there to be a decision one way or the other. Guys, you know what I'm talking about? You know where I'm coming? That moment right there. But what she didn't know was that a couple months prior, I had gone and asked her dad for her hand in marriage. But I wanted it to be a surprise. And so I, I wouldn't talk to her about the future of our relationship. <laughs> Very comforting for any girl, right? And so uh, what happens then is she gets a call. She gets a job offer to go to Iraq in like two weeks. Oh. And she calls me up and says, listen, I'm, I got to make this move. So I said, well, okay, let's, let's get together tonight. We're going to have dinner. We're going to talk about it, and we'll figure this thing out. So I get off the phone, and I had, like two weeks later, had planned this whole thing out, so I had to cancel everything and try to move it up. And so we go out, and, and I mean, I pour the romance. I take her to the first place, the, the place that we had on our first date, right? Burritos and chips. <laughs> I mean, fastball, right? And uh, so we go there, and then we go on this long walk afterwards, and we come around the corner, and there's this table set up with three platters. And she looks at it, and then she turns and looks at me, and I'm down on one knee right there. And she starts bawling. <laughs> Not the reaction that I was hoping for right there. But fortunately, they were, they were, te they were good tears. And, uh, and then a band came out and they started playing. And then the, guy, the, the media guy in the bushes came out with his camera. And it wasn't like the little iPhone. It was like the old school, like in a 64 pound camera, you could see a lunar eclipse. I mean, it was, and then the limo pulls up to take us all around the city that day. And, uh, and then my favorite gift was I pulled out this t-shirt that had nothing but my face on it. <laughs> and, it really speaks for itself. Could we get a close-up? Do we have the close-up? <laughs> there are children puking in the back right now. She needed to know what she was getting into. That's right. That's it right there. I mean, she was going around, and people are like, oh, are you sure? You're good. That's good. We're good. Okay. It's okay. And I, you know, I think I might have got the best end of that deal. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. All right. Not that much of one. <laughs> but it was one little yes that changed the course of our lives, that changed our priorities in a moment, in a decision. But here's the thing. It wasn't just one little yes. That one little yes was not the ending point. It was the beginning point, right? Every day I say yes to Nina. Literally, I get up and I roll out of the bed. And when I put the decorative pillows back on the bed, I'm saying <laughs> yes to Nina. I don't know their purpose. I don't understand. Nobody comes into this room ever. Just us, just our family. And there's no function to them at all. But I put, and I'm saying yes to Nina every day when I put those on. When I go on a missions trip. And she has the kids all by herself without me for those all three kids. She is saying yes to me through that experience. When we go on a Saturday and we serve with National Community Church on an outreach experience, we are saying yes to our marriage. It's a consistent yes. It's not just the beginning. It's after one yes, things aren't done, are they? No, things have just begun in that moment. Today's one little yes is saying yes to priorities. When talking about priorities, what we have to realize is yes is not singular in nature, is it? It's a residual yes. It's a resounding yes that echoes every single day. I've only got a year of Greek under my belt, but let me, so I'm far from a teacher, but let me give us a quick lesson in Greek right now. Okay, so you have English verbs have tense past, present, and future, right? Greek words are the same way. They have the same tense, except there's an additional thing called aspect, okay? So you can take a Greek verb in the present tense, and it can also have future application. For example, you take Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, and it says, be filled with the Spirit, 
Okay, so it's a, in our English translation, it's a singular occurrence. But when you look at the Greek, it, it's more correctly translated as, as continuously be filled in the Spirit or repeatedly be refilled, be filled in the Spirit or be refilled, be filled again and again and again in the Spirit of God. So something happens. It's not just a singular occurrence. It is an ongoing every day yes, if you will. When you say yes to Christ, it's one little yes, the priority. But you have to understand the tense of that yes. You're saying yes to being filled in the Spirit today, but you're also saying yes to getting up early on Monday morning to pray. You're saying yes when your, your housemate shows up and they do that same thing that always annoys you and you're going to give them grace in that moment. You're saying yes when you're at work and your coworker steps out of bounds and you decide to have patience. It's not a single yes. It's an ongoing yes. One little yes to priorities has the aspect of a thousand yeses to priorities. E.M. Gray spent his life trying to find what the, the commonality was in successful people. And in his essay, uh, The Common Denominator of Success, he said this. He said, it's not a work ethic. Uh, it's not connections and relationships. It's not business acumen. It's this. It's that those people keep first things first. That's what brings success. The book of uh, Haggai is kind of tucked away back in the Old Testament. It's that book that when the preacher acknowledges it, you got to kind of sneak up to the table of contents, right, to figure out where exactly this thing is. And then you get to, and, and, and Haggai has a powerful yet simple message, and it's this, keep first things first. You got to keep first things first. And he's speaking to an audience that's not dissimilar to us here today. And he's speaking to an audience that, that, that they, in theory, desire to have God as their priority. But in this instance, they have walked away. They have strayed from God as a priority in their existence. And so Agai, he comes along and he, challenge, and he pushes them back to be who they have called, been called to be. He communicates a powerful word, though. And here's the deal. We need a revelation from God. We need a revelation from God. It was last week that 104 people raised up their hand saying, I have had a revelation from God and I am deciding to follow him. I am deciding to pursue him. We need a revelation from the Lord. Nothing can replace a revelation from God in your hearts. It changes us for the better. It makes us new. It leads us into the presence of God. There's no replacing a revelation from the Lord. When he comes into us, he does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. It's a humbling thing to come to the foot of the cross and to lay down our sins and to follow Christ. But only the man who seeks the kingdom of heaven, he has to come and he has to receive a revelation from God. Now listen, hear this today. We need that, but, but some of us here today, some of us don't need a new revelation. Some of us need a consistent reminder of what he's already done in our hearts, right? If you've received a revelation and you've done nothing with it, why are you asking for a new revelation? He's already given you something. Your calling is to go back, to be obedient, to take it off the shelf, to take it out from your back pocket. God has spoke to you. Our duty is to respond to his voice within our being. I'm here to remind us today that God has called you, that he has plans, he has purposes, and our calling is to, in, to, is to be in his presence. The Jews, they had returned to Jerusalem after Babylonian captivity in this time period in, in Haggai. And uh, the, the temple had been, it had laid rest. It had been destroyed 70 years prior. And so the Jews come back and they begin to rebuild the temple. But then they put it aside and something happens in the city. There's this revitalization. There's this urban renewal. There's this, this revival in a sense. And business starts springing up. And the crops are planted. And houses are starting to be rebuilt. But all the while the temple sits dormant over here. 
And weeds begin to grow up out of the foundation of the temple. And this is when Haggai shows up and he looks at the people and he looks at the temple and he says, that empty temple is a reflection of the emptiness within your heart because you have set priorities aside today. It is a reflection. It is a metaphor. It is a picture of where priorities are, are in this place and in your heart. And he calls them back. He gets up in their face and he challenges them to come back and to take what they know as priority and put it into practice. And today, that's what I want to do. I want to talk about four things, four challenges as we seek to come back and make God a priority in our own lives. The first is this, live without excuse. You can jot these down if you have a pen. First is this, live without excuse. Verse two of chapter one of the book of Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. The Israelites, they knew that God should be priority. But there's so much going on. There's so much happening. Their schedules are crazy. Their boss puts so much work on them. There's, I mean, there's just not time to do this. Now, am I describing ancient Israel right now or am I describing modern day D.C. here today? We want to serve God. Yes, I'm on board with that. We believe in that. But there's just not time. There's just no margin in my schedule to do this. Do you know that with your priorities, you don't find time for those things? If, you are fine, if you're trying to find time, if you're waiting for time to come to you to do these, I mean, you'll, you'll be waiting longer than the Redskins are going to win the NFL championship. You know, long, long. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> Cheap chat, I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't find time for prior, you make time. It's the important versus the urgent. The urgent will always win. If you don't fight for the important in your lives, you gotta fight for it and, and, and hold that dear and hold it first in your life. You can either have priorities or you can have excuses. You can't have both of those things. We're called out, listen, the the the, the payoff of priorities never comes in the moment. You hear me? Like 6 a.m. workouts are never good at 6 a.m. You know when they're good? They're good at 7 a.m. When you're done and you're walking out the gym. I love 6 a.m. workouts, don't you? But when's the last time you were on the bike at 6 a.m. going up that hill and your guy next to you leaned over and said, this is awesome. I love 6 a.m. workouts. <laughs> The payoff always comes after the priority, doesn't it? It always comes later on. If we make it a priority, though, God will use it. Listen, you can either feel sorry tomorrow, or you can, or you, you can there's a pain that comes when you uh, make something a priority. You can feel sorry, or you can feel sore. One is a good pain. The other is a bad pain. But either way, what are, what's the choice that we're gonna, going to make? I don't regret a single time. I don't re regret a single moment in the scriptures. I don't re regret a single uh, moment in prayer that I have spent this past year. Because I know this, that every time I get in the presence of God, I know this, that God's blessing today is the result of yesterday's prayer, of putting him first. I know in D.C., time is our God, isn't it? Busyness is our addiction. It's our attraction. It's our badge of honor. How you doing? Busy. Oh, really? No, I'm because I am really busy. I mean, like, I have so much going on and it's all it, it becomes a duel for who's the busyness busiest, right? And and it becomes an identity in a sense. But time is not ours. Time is his. And he has, called it, calls us to, he has called us to use it for his purposes. When Jesus comes, the disciples, and they get up, he doesn't say, all right, guys, we got some time. What should we do? No, he says, come on, let's go. Let's do this. He doesn't say, when you have some time, when there's margin in your schedule, uh, disciples, then I want to think about doing this project over here. No, he says, I have called you two by two. Now go. I am sending you out like lambs among the wolves. And he sends them out as forerunners to his presence. When is your time 
to make priority priority, to make God priority. When does that time come? It's today. It's your time. It's my time. It's high time that we get on God's time. And God's time is not yesterday. God's time is not tomorrow. His time is today. It's right here. It's right now. It's in this house. And he has called us. He has called us not to say right to following him. He has called us to say right now. I will follow you, God, and I will pursue you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> we seek all these things, but he says no. All these things only come around when you seek my kingdom, when you seek my righteousness first. Then I will add all these things unto you. Don't sweat that stuff. Don't sweat this stuff over here. No, lock in on me. Center yourself on me. Fix your eyes on me. I'm the author and the perfecter of your faith. Come and pursue and follow me, and I will take care of the rest. Heidi Scanlon, our pastor of press, said it this way. She says, everybody loves you and has a, a good plan for your life. Yeah. Right? They will order your steps if you don't allow God to order your steps. He didn't call you to do everything. He called you to pursue him, to follow him first, and he will take care of the rest. He will come. Now listen, all these things are added unto you. Sometimes our all these things are different than God's all these things, right? Like, like we want our wants, like, you know, finances and comfort and security, but God wants our needs, the need of provision, the need of pushing us into ministry, the need of pushing us into service and giving and generosity. So sometimes we cut out and simplify the things that God has given us to become more like him so that we can become uh, more like our wants. But don't cut those things out. Those are from the Lord. Pursue him. Pursue him first, and he will add everything else behind him. When you're buttoning, buttoning your shirt and you get that first one wrong, you know what I'm talking about? It's not until you get to the top, you think you're doing it, you think you're getting ready, but then you get there and all your work was to waste, right? When you get that first one right, I'm kind of worried, did I get it right now? Okay. <laughs> when you get the first one right, everything else follows in conclusion to that. When we put him first, when we put him first. All these things are added. Billy Sunday defined an excuse as the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. You don't find time for priority. You make time for priority. Number two. Number one, live without excuses. Number two, live selflessly. Verse three and four. And the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? The temple had laid waste for 14 years. During the time the people were importing this expensive cedar to build up their houses, to make these extravagant houses. So on the one hand, they have valid excuse, and on the other hand, they have paneled houses. We can all identify our valid excuses, but let me ask you today, what are your paneled houses? What have you put before the Lord what have you put in front of him that is purely out of selfishness? He calls us to be selfless. In the Old Testament, anytime there was a covenant, something had to die. Something had to be sacrificed. It's what Galatians 2.20 says. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ, he lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The only way for us to serve God and put him first is to allow Christ to live within us from the inside out. I met this week with one of the, uh, one of the guys from one of my small groups, and uh, he said, man, I just got to share what God's doing in my life. And I want to I wanna share a little bit of, of that with us today. He said this, in the past couple months, I've become a totally new person. My life was about me, about building my business, about building my body, about pursuing my goals. And I started pursuing Christ. All of a sudden, I started caring about people. God is breaking down my selfishness. I knew what priorities were, but I was pursuing my wants in greater proportion than pursuing my priorities. When I started pursuing God, my wants got less. The person who I was a year ago wouldn't even recognize who I am today. 
If you were to ask me who I cared about, it would be my family and me. Now I have these other people in my life that I'm giving to, that I'm investing in. It's awesome and overwhelming. It's God. I love it. It's not what we have, is it? It's who we have in our lives. He lost some things in this process, but he gained God. He found himself. He gained brothers around him. Live without excuses. Live selflessly. And number three, consider your ways. Verse five. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Take some time to consider your priorities today. Take some time to consider your ways. Maybe culture says you're doing great. Maybe your friends or, your co- or the people around you say, man, you're doing fantastic. But what's your heart say today? What's your heart telling you today? God says, consider your ways. Pastor Mark would say it this way. He said, the man began to climb the ladder of success. And he got to the top and he looked down and he realized his ladder was against the wrong building. When we consider our ways, we begin to evaluate what our true priorities are and what they should be. Number four, rebuild your temple. Verse seven and eight. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. To rebuild the temple, they had to make a shift in schedule, a shift in time, a shift in finances, right? If you were to come to me and say, Joel, man, could you disciple me and and could you like help me realize what my, my priorities are? We would do two things. We would open up your schedule, your calendar, and we'd look at that and then we'd open up your bank statement and we'd look at that. And if you see the dominant things in those two areas, you're going to realize what your true priorities really are. Here's what happened when they built the temple. Not only did they put God first, but they put him in the central place. They rebuilt this temple and the temple was in the middle of it all. It was in a central place to the city. So they didn't just get up and give God the first part of their day, did they? No, any time they moved throughout the city, they walked past that central place. It was a crossroads. It was a crossing pass. And so constantly everything that they did, everything that they were a part of, God was at the center of that. He was right in the middle. He was the central point for anything that they did, for anything that they said to one another. If you have a list of priorities, God can be one of those, right? God, and there's family, and there's There's fun, and there's leisure, and there's work, and there's money, and there's all these different priorities in our lives, and we can make God one of those, and we can even get him up to the top of that that list of things. But, But I like the way Pastor Heather talked about it. You know, you can put God at the high point in your linear list, or you can put God as the central hub on a wheel. There's a big difference, right? Because one, you can compartmentalize things. Okay, I did my God thing. I'm here at service. Now I'm going to go do this thing next. Instead, when God is the central hub and every other priority is the spoke around that, when you go to your workplace, God is centrally involved. He's right in the middle of it. When you go to your home, when you go out with your friends, wherever you're at, God is in the central place. That's what he has called us to do. That's how he has called us to be within our relationship with him. When I came to D.C., I came initially to work with Dr. Foth, who is a friend of ours and comes and speaks sometimes at the church. And one of the first guys that we met was a guy named Charlie White. And uh, Charlie was a former Navy submarine captain turned chief of staff for a Virginia congressman. And when I got to know him, it was right when he found out that he had terminal cancer. And so I got to know Charlie by just going and sitting with him. We would sit. And when you have a couple months to live, you only talk about what's important. And so he would talk about faith and family, and that was it. And uh, so we would go and talk, and, and Charlie 
this was the beginning of his walk with Christ. And so God brought him to a new place in his life. And we would just talk about that. And I remember what he said. Um, He said this. He said, God doesn't just change the way you see yourself. He changes the way you see everything and everyone around you. He changes it all. When I go outside and I see the blue sky and the clouds, I think of what a wonderful creator we have. He said, when I hear the laugh of children, I just think, man, thank you for the joy that you give us. And he said, and and I woke up and I looked over and I saw my wife and, and I suddenly realized that God had given me the Mona Lisa, this masterpiece was with me this whole time and I didn't even realize it. When you follow God, everything changes. Everyone around you changes. They're the same, but all of a sudden they're different because you are seeing things through his eyes. God was not just a part of his life. He was not just an addition or a new compartment to his life. He was the central portion. He was the central piece to who Charlie was in those last days and everything that he was, everything that he said, every attitude that he had was affected because of the grace of God was centrality within him. Simple goal today. Simple goal for our sermon. Let's make God the center of our lives. The central point of who we are. On your way in, you got a, a green card, and uh, it has our, our one little yes branding on it. And uh, this is just a simple visual reminder of what God does in your heart and through this series for you to take it with you. This today is a priority list, if you will. So I want to challenge you here for just a few moments. And if you got a pen, you can pull it out right now. If you don't, you can do this later. But my challenge for you is this. I want to ask you to try to step into Charlie's shoes for just a minute here today. To put yourself in his place. If you got a couple of months, what's that one thing? What's that one priority? What's that one little yes that God has called you to pursue? Over the next couple of months, what is that one simple thing for some of us here today? We're new to faith and we're new to following Christ. And that one little yes for us is is a one little yes to begin to pray or to begin to read the scripture or to begin to to get in community or a small group. For others here today, maybe, maybe we are disconnected from family. We have broken relationships with our family. We need to leave the altar and go pursue and say one little yes to reconciliation within our family. For others who are here today, God has given you a revelation and he's put it in your spirit and your heart, but you've set it aside. And you haven't obeyed the revelation of God within you. Today is your day. Now is your time. Right now is your time to step forward in obedience to the Holy Spirit within you. That's your one little yes today. For some, you are in destructive relationships. And you've got to say one little yes to get out of that. For each one of us, let's let the Holy Spirit come and speak into our being and speak into our heart. Let's let him work. Let's be responded to the Spirit of God within us. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise. We give you honor today, Lord. Lord, I pray that in the simplest of ways, as we talk about priorities today and we look at your word and we look at your scripture, I pray that you would help us to make courageous decisions Lord, just as you called out the Israelites to come back to the temple, to come back and rebuild the priorities that they knew were true in their heart, Father, I pray in the same way that in our hearts you would help us to lean into you today, to respond to your Spirit's prompting, and to seek and search you out today. We pray for a revelation in our hearts, God. Ask that you would give us a new revelation within our hearts today. Lord, we submit ourselves to you. Pray that you would be honored within us today, God. That we would be obedient to your promptings and our spirit. We commit these things to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.